We're going to do an abbreviated summary of Class 2, Semester 3, Comparative Theology Science, Dr. Alan Childs, Ph.D. The purpose of uh, the academia of Class 2, as with all Semester 3, is to bring our understanding to a place of how we examine uh, God's study, uh, theology, and relate it with uh, science and nature. Uh, basically a study of the relativity of God and mankind in particular. In particular, today we're going to be talking about the dimensions, the multi-dimensions. And uh, this, will, of course, will be a, a hypothetic and hypothesis presentation. So let's uh, do just a little bit of explanation uh, in, uh, about scientific examination process. In any examination of scientific nature in these days and times, it begins with a gathering of information and evidences to pursue a usually a hypothetical thought to bring together the information needed, or, or data, we might say, to build a support base for an, a hypothesis. Once we have uh, secured a structural outline of information and data, evidence for support of your hypothesis, then we can formulate a th theory, a theoretic. Theoretics quite often, uh, when we're talking about theology and science, will have to be supported both in an authoritative theological sense, which uh, in our case being a Christian study group, examination group, uh, we use the Bible text, the scriptures, as our authority text. And of course, most standard science academic academia these days, uh, in these times we live, do not accept the Bible scripture as being an authority text. It, it's simply a literary consideration on their part. We do accept it as an authority text. But we also include uh, in our examinations that the examination of meanings within the text, in other words, the interpretations of the translated information, which it is all translated information, uh, being as how it is ancient text that has been translated and uh, from original writing. Uh, so today we would be doing our modern interpretation based on what we know of what has already been written down and translated for us. Translation is no longer the challenge it once was. With the literary uh, Trans transliteration tools we have now. Interpretation is the real challenge. Comparative theology science uses comparatives as considerations in our interpretation of what we study or examine. So, with that being said, the next step of any theoretic th th uh, theory would be a structure model of how things are defined in reality. Uh, everyone can understand physical structures, uh, such as looking at a building or a machine. And what this involves is a level of engineering. So in the comparatives, theology, science, our conclusions are presented as a structure, a model. So when you think of a model for understanding, uh, such as the Bohr model you would use in chemistry, it revolutionizes and changes the way we understand things. So I'm going to move on from that now, uh, just letting you know the factors involved in uh, our lectures and, and how they're, first of all, built. Uh, moving on from that. The information gathered is uh, 
quite often over periods of years and decades. Some of us who are older, uh, we could go into uh, 50 years of study and never build a model. It just depends on how you approach your examination. So from the very earliest beginnings, we must realize uh, what sense, what structure do we make of the information that we have given. So in considering Scripture today, talking about the dimensions, we want to build our structure presentation based upon a model of all the experiences taken from the Scriptures. And we're also going to include landscapes from the antiquity writings, the literatures of, of all ancient writings, that would be a significant contribution, especially those referenced in the authority scriptures, such as the prophecies of Enoch, etc. We also consider the uh, ancient histories, our best sources, of course, when we're comparing biblical literatures, would be from uh, things recognized in the biblical literature, such as the book of Jasher. We don't consider it necessarily on the same level as we would the canon, but we do not dismiss it as not being useful in uh, building our hypothesis and our theoretic data information. Talking now, uh, moving on from that class introduction, this is a summary, as I mentioned today, of class two, uh, talking about the multidimensional structure of reality. Everyone who is Christian today regardless of whether or not they have divided themselves out as a denominational group, uh, or they are a spiritualist individual just examining open scripture, which I consider myself a spiritualist Christian. Uh, I do not consider myself a denominal Christian, nor anything of the form of such as the Catholic belief or whatever. I'm a born-again Christian according to the totality of the New Testament teachings as a whole. And most of the folks who uh, are involved with us in examining our subjects are from that position also. Uh, in other words, we take the whole Bible as being useful in our interpretations of meanings within context. We don't take verses and scriptures out of context and build a model based on pieces and parts collected in abstract. We build these thoughts, our hypothesis, and our structure and theoretic, applying the engineering modeling ability according to the open interpretation in context of what's written. <clears throat> so that's our philosophy regarding our faith. Faith statement being the Lord Jesus Christ is our Savior, our Lord, our eternal King. And today that's going to be, uh, in summary of what's covered in the two-part class, we're going to talk just a few minutes about what we have structured in our understandings about our eternal King, our relationship, where we're going in the multidimensional sense. Uh, go back a little bit here. Uh, most of your denominal uh, churches base their uh, belief systems on what is taught in their uh, seminaries and their theological theological institutions or theological seminaries and uh, quite often what will happen there is they break out certain uh, positions from the complete text and focus on those and tend to ignore the others or just dismiss them as no longer being relevant well, everything in the scriptures is still relevant. Why? Because we're going to be talking about a particular relativity in the multi-dimensions of reality. And, well, where's that going? Well, when you think of life, you experience life uh, as a, what we commonly refer to as a three-part being without getting into definitions of things like triune being and all that, let's just keep it simple and say spirit, mind, and body. Well, the spirit, mind, and body, uh, however 
that is broken out, and that's a complex study in itself. All communicate through this magnificent biochemical machine, mechanism, structured and built by a magnificent and wonderful design of God, our brains. The brains of the human being are such a magnificent accommodation for us to operate not only in the physical world. What could you do without your brain? Well, I don't think we even need to do a, a, a diagnostic of that. Because most of you realize you couldn't do anything without your brain. And you wouldn't, if you could, you wouldn't be aware of it because your brain allows you to process your own self-identity with your surroundings. Well, uh, what I'm going to let you know is, is that the brain is also our bridge connection. It is our interface with the spirit world also. <clears throat> now, uh, by that, I'm going to also say that since the multi-dimensions are somewhat disconnected from our physical reach, now, of course, I understand that our, our brain is also connected, as we know, in the physical. So everything within our known processes in the normal course of the day or within physical reach, connection, interface. But many folks are not really fully aware, and for good reason, of their spiritual interface. So how does that operate? Well, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and just tell you what I have come to know uh, over the many, many years of considering this. Is this telepathic? The telepathic abilities of the brain work within the range of the realm of what most would call the imagination area of the brain. We have our conscious motor activities, which uh, any uh, one in science would be able to fairly well explain to you, uh, especially in the medical field, that uh, are in connection with how we operate physically. That's our motor skills. Uh, the synopsis of the brain operates uh, electromechanically, basically through the synopsis, the nerve connections. But how does the brain connect us with the unseen world, the what some consider the phenomenon uh, uh, realm of operation. And this, this is telepathic. Uh, all right. Now, how, how this happens is it's measurable that electro uh, EMF readings in scientific examination medically of the human brain shows that they're only able to, they are only able to determine that the brain is used 5 to 10 percent. Of its, of its capacity. So what is the, let's say, the other 90% of the brain? In other words, the majority of the mass of the brain, they don't know what it, what it works for, what it's used for. What's its purpose? What's dormant? What's not dormant? It can only be measured in EMF, uh, electromotive force. Uh, that's what that EMF is acronym for. So, what I wanted to tell you now is that your spiritual experiences are bridged within portions of the brain that God activates. Now, does God have to intervene and trigger this mechanism for it to operate? Well, I'm going to say it does take two here in relationship. Uh, I'm going to say that this part of the brain is activated by what we call the spirit. The Spirit of God. So that is one of the essential reasons why we must be born again. Uh, Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3 that lest a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So is there something different about the vision ability of a person who is born again of the Spirit? But then again, Jesus went even the next step and told Nicodemus there in chapter 3, Gospel of John, read it for yourself, a man cannot enter into the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Well, okay, folks, I, I realize that we're getting into an area of doctrinal interpretation. 
But I'm going to take you into an area of dimensional interpretation now. To where that you are going to understand the kingdom of God as you never have pictured it or understood it or envisioned it before. And after all, isn't that what revelation is about? Isn't that what understanding is about? Is to go into places that you have never been taken before. And unless you're born again, your spirit's not going to go to these places. It's not going to be able to go to these places. Why? Because the use of that part of your brain is not going to be opened up to you. Now, the prophets who saw the great visions, what we call vision, visions because they were able to see it. They were able to experience it by vision. Able to experience it by seeing it. Why? Because they were holy men. What made them holy? The Spirit of God. They were separated unto the purposes of God. Wholly separated. So they were able to operate within the Spirit. The New Testament calls it inspired by the Holy Ghost. You see. So, if you want to operate in the spiritual realm, in the particular spiritual realm, relationship, in that relativity, and be able to navigate, you're not going to be able to do it on your own. It's going to require two components of operation. Your willingness, your separation, disconnecting yourselves from the things that distract, the things that are not respected or honored in the presence of a holy God. And you're going to have to allow that the Lord open it up. The Lord allow, open your eyes to see, as the prophets pray. Such as in John, um, the Revelation, uh, written by John, recorded by John, where the angel stood by his side. What was that angel standing by his side for when he saw all these marvelous visions and was communicating understandings? The angel was standing by his side as an operator to open up these areas because the Lord had sent him as an operator, as a helper, as a communicator to the human mind of John. Because John, being like all the rest of us, was used to operating in the normal uh, motor activities of the brain. Although he did have, of course, a holy separation. So you see, God uses his subordinate created beings and entities to operate with us through the Spirit. That's why it's so essential, and notice I use the word essential, to obey all instruction of the New Testament writings. Don't delete any of it. Don't say it's no longer necessary to do what they did in those days because the Bible doesn't give us that dismissal in its writing, in its text. You still need the spiritual gifts in order to be able to operate in the spirit because your brain does not operate in that realm correctly without it. Now notice why I say correctly. We make definite declaration that we have only one spirit guide. Spirit guide is a modern use word. Uh, since people like uh, Edgar Casey and those came along with their uh, uh, postulations and ideas concerning spiritualism. Well, we already had our ideas established in spiritualism as Christians. It's just that those, most folks didn't understand how to teach it. Because they weren't experienced in it. You have to be experienced in the spiritual relative realm. Activities in the spirit. And given understandings through revelation. By those experiences to be able to teach such things. So there's your explanation why most denominal theological seminaries. Theological institutions do not teach it. They don't have the spiritual experience. We're not dismissing the practical information. The practical experience is still a requirement also. But there are times when we're able to bypass the human experience and move into the spiritual experience, connecting with God. Paul talked about that when he talked about the gifts of the Spirit and the operations of the gift. And Paul recognized that most of us, when he was teaching this, are very small children, have very little, very little knowledge of it. When you begin to talk about the, the operations of the Spirit, in the uh, administration of the Spirit, the governments of the Spirit, uh, Paul realized in his teaching there 
and basically I'm talking about in Corinthians to the to your church at Corinth when he was talking, talking about the spiritual gifts. He realized that people were ignorant as they are today about this because they haven't really experienced it before. And if they have, it was in, in, in an abstract sense uh, where they were vulnerable to other uh, influences in the spiritual realm. The spiritual realm is a multidimensional place. Uh, let me go back to the landscape information. Uh, Enoch, the man in the, uh, written about in Genesis there, the, uh, <clears throat> son of Methuselah, uh, father of Lamech, and, uh, the great, uh, great, great grandfather, I'm sorry, Enoch was the father of Methuselah, excuse me, uh, and the great grandfather of Noah. Excuse me, I had to correct myself there. Uh, it's written about him that uh, there was prophecy of, of Enoch. But you don't find that prophecy written within the canon. So somehow it didn't make it into the canon. Thankfully to the to the discoveries of the Dead Sea Scrolls, we found out that the books of the Enoch were actually legitimate after all. Uh, they were not as where they were determined to be by the uh, Roman Catholic Church uh examination to where they determined them to be otherwise. But they were found to be legitimate after all and being much older than what they had been determined to be by the examiners of the Roman Catholic Church. So with that being said, uh, looking into the sources of information in the fragments within the book of Enoch from the Dead Sea Scrolls, we find that there's a place and there's a passage in, in Enoch, among many others, where he actually is taken by the angel. How's he taken by the angel? He's taken by the angel by that brain connection I'm telling you about, the telepathic, because he is separated from the activities of his body here on earth. I've experienced this myself. And yes, there, you are truly separated somehow in a physical body, uh, I mean, for the physical body in a spiritual body, but yet still operating through the same self identification of the human brain. So the human brain is telepathic, and it's able to reach into places uh, as a, an efficient uh, interface beyond what we ever dreamed it to be before. Yes, there are some scientists who are researching this. Uh, there's quite a bit of uh, depth going into trying to investigate that. We understand scientists are limited in their ability to examine what goes on in the brain because of the limitations of the apparatus of examination. The microscope they use, perhaps, the the, uh, uh, the, the electronic uh, sensors that, such as brainwave uh, devices to uh, interpret what they see. So scientists are limited. The best research can be done on your own in prayer, in separation with God, and allow God to open your understanding. And this is where mine's coming from. Uh, I'm not ignorant of the sciences by any means. I know about the God helmet thing and all that, the research in South America where they were looking for spiritual activity in the brain and all that. And, you know, I'm not taken away from the merit of that sort of examination. And I say it's very limited. But anyway, back to uh, Enoch. In Enoch's writings, uh, Enoch accounts of where he has shown platforms, platforms of separations of souls in a place after the passing of their life here on earth, so to speak. In other words, in the uh, multi-dimensions. And that's exactly what he was looking at. He was looking at what we would call rooms of accommodation within the dimensions. So I'm going to say right now, and, and I'm going to have to try to be brief uh, for uh, conservation of time here. Uh, in, in chapter 2, uh, in in class two, semester three, the two-part class, this being just a summary, what we're introducing you to is that the kingdom of God is not as you once thought it was. Strictly all a literal thing of the limited physical experience that you see with the five senses. That is a very real reality that is eternal and that truly what you're experiencing here with the five senses of the motor skills of the body, touch, taste, hearing, sight, those things, uh, are temporary. Those are temporary. 
But the what you normally call spiritual is the technically the permanent or eternal reality that will continue unchanged, where time has no effect, where corrosion and decay do not enter in. Uh, and you do have a spiritual body. And it is that spiritual body that will stand before the throne of God, where the good, the bad, and the ugly are all judged. Uh, they call it the white throne judgment in the book of Revelations uh, toward the end writings there, where everyone's gathered together, both great and small, and stand before the throne of judgment. In this real place, in between here and there, uh, and, and that's almost an improper word. I just don't have a better term for it. Uh, you have life here on earth, our first level. Then you have what's called the in-between state, which has been, uh, people have tried to describe it. Uh, uh, Dante Alighieri and his divine comedy, uh, Dante's Inferno, uh, did his effort to describe the in-between state. Uh, most read it in the Old Testament, uh, uh, in the Bible, as Bible writes, as Abraham's bosom, taken from the accounting by Jesus of the rich man of Lazarus. So when we're talking about the passing from life here, in this reality, into the next level, we're going into the multidimensional. Right now, the way you experience the multidimensional is first off beginning with the new birth experience, where you follow the instructions to bring yourself to condition. You repent, and that's that's quite a study in itself. And, and I have did that in other parts. You can examine in my other lectures on YouTube. They're there free. I don't charge for my ministry. This is not a commercial ministry. This is a ministry of appliance to be used in my calling and service to God. I can't charge for what belongs to God. I'm not a commercial minister. I'm a servant minister of the Most High God. I'm a samurai for the Lord, so to speak, is where the world would understand it. But let me, let me say this now. Um, I need you to open your mind to some possibilities that will ring true once you truly consider them before the Lord. You can go to these dimensional places, but only with the help of the Lord. When you obey, obey Scripture and or repent, repent and are baptized in the name, uh, all the New Testament, they were baptized in the name. Beginning with Matthew 28, 19, Jesus' own words, be baptized in the name of not titles. And then Peter's words in Acts 2.38, the name of the Lord Jesus. And they were baptized in the name of the Lord in all other places. So that's just biblical. That's not opinion. That's biblical instruction. So when you follow that instruction, then you come to a place of condition. Condition to be able to walk in the holy place. No one could walk in holy places in the Bible unless they were at condition. Do you understand that? How much clearer can that be? That in, in the Old Testament, the prophets did not walk in the holy place until they were at condition. Uh, you want evidence? Look at Moses. When Moses approached where he was going to be spoken to at the burning bush by the invisible God, he had to arrive at condition. The Lord said, take your shoes off. You stand in a holy place. See, there were conditions. He couldn't just approach the holy presence of God as he was. He had to meet conditions. Today, for you to go to the multi-dimensions of the spiritual, and spiritual is a whole opening up of another world. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. Not of this world. How plain can it be? It's a multidimensional place. Only through the Lord Jesus, by the guiding of his Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, are you able to understand these things. So why would you want to stop short? Why would you not want to go the distance 
of the many depths and heights of the places that we can go multidimensionally. Now don't be as they were at the birth of the church there uh, after the post-day of Pentecost experience where it says great fear fell upon all. Don't fear. Don't fear to move forward in God. Desire it. Love it and embrace it. Now I think you can see that we could go very, very deep with this discussion. And uh, I would recommend that you definitely review my um, sermon topic available on YouTube. Uh, the Holy Ghost Experience, Part 3. Because I'm going to uh, share with you there my personal testimony of the very first time that I actually walked in those places like Enoch talked about, where he was taken by an angel. And I'm giving you my first-hand accounting of what I am allowed to remember of that experience, similar in my own experience and walk in the spiritual dimensions. The spiritual dimensions are powerful. They are very real. And they're a place that we approach with a holy attitude of separation. In other words, with great fear and respect for an all-powerful, almighty God. God operates through his subordinates. He uses angels. He uses people to do his bidding. The invisible God of glory revealed his communication to us through the life and ministry of the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God in creation. Now in the multi-dimensions, I'm going to wrap up and I'm going to close with this consideration to let you know. There are many types of beings, many types of creatures God has created. And we, in particular, have a relationship. The others have a separate relationship with God. For us, in particular, mankind, the biblical peoples, he made accommodation, he made a way for our salvation by the biblical instruction, in particular, for us. In that the Lord sent his only begotten son in the form and the flesh of a man, the Lamb of God, that would die in our place to purchase back salvation for fallen humanity. That's a broader, greater study. But simply stated, in particular, not only in particular dimensionally for our place in creation as an individual identified species, but also through a particular lineage of that identified species from the Generations of Adam and Eve. That's a broader study. But let's just say don't let a narrow, very shallow examination from a different plane of perspective of examination shut you off from the beautiful realities of God that you, your privilege, I won't even call it a right, I'll call it a privilege, Purchased for you by the Lamb of God. Don't don't shut that out. Don't willingly be ignorant when you have this opportunity. Now, I have only one spirit guide, and that is the spirit of truth, the Holy Ghost. I declare that my spiritual guide. There are many spirits, and there are many angels, and there are many demonics and other types of creatures in the interdimensional realm. I have encountered some of them. By experience myself. But they're not my spirit guide. Understand that. They're creatures like you and I. Of a different type. Of a different kind. Some are not flesh and blood as you and I. Some are. Some were. And are no more. But they're a different kind. We are after our kind. We have a particular kind, a particular relationship in reality, in relativity, in the grand scheme of creation. And the last part of this closing, in summary, 
What where does that leave people who uh investigate EBEs, etc., which I have also had a great interest and experience in my life. It stirred me to move to these places of examination. EBEs uh, being extraterrestrial biological entities. Or just extraterrestrial entities. Whether they're biological or not. There, there's many. The many places of the cosmos. And the many dimensional places sandwiched in or shall we say in relationship with the many places of the cosmos. Billions upon billions of worlds and stars in the places, the habitations of just the three-dimensional world we view. Four-dimensional counting time, of course. But of the many dimensions of reality that even scientists today recognize, up to 11, 10 known, 11, all in theoretic, including the physical experiments of the four. Even science today is recognizing a multi-universe on a grand cosmic and interdimensional cosmic scale. Do you understand the significance of that? That they're realizing that time is a variable, not constant, in the multiverse? Do you realize the significance of that? The significance is that there's a much bigger and bigger and broader picture. The, the very Nobel Prize winning genome researchers recognize the complexity to be such a grand structure that there is no probable way of it happening by chaos or random. There's a grand design, folks. Now, what I'm trying to tell you is this. Your spiritual experience to know your creator intimately is there. Bring yourself to condition by obeying the biblical instruction. Now, if you want to make a distance journey to visit us in person, we'll help you. We'll help you. Now, you've got to do your part. No one's going to be able to do it for you except the Lord Jesus Christ. But he's going to require you to come to condition with him. No, take your shoes off. Stand on that holy ground. Every Tuesday, we are in a frontier outpost area doing our mission, our calling, doing our best to apply our ministry in a way that serves our true calling. Pipe Creek, Texas. Every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, we meet for prayer and for the word from the scriptures. And God visits us by the Holy Spirit every Sunday morning and anoints. Make the journey. It'll be worth your time. God will talk to you on the way. Turn the radio off. Move all the distractions and pray with your mind. Pray with your mouth. Use all your facility. But come be with us and, and we'll help you find that condition in that place, in that location, the meeting of God. Every second Saturday at 7 p.m. there at the Pike Creek Community Center also, we have our evening gathering. Uh, right now it's just once a month because of lack of support. Uh, we're, we've only been in this community now for almost a year. And we knew when we came, this is not like going to a church that's established. We're carving it out of stone. And the Lord is using his hand to carve the characters upon those stones. But but here, numbers are slow in gathering because we are in a very sparsely populated area, a very special field of ministry. And we are not discouraged. We are greatly encouraged with you. Now I'm going to close the short prayer. Because the horizons of where we're going here in semester three uh, are so mind-boggling that it is difficult for most to allow themselves to go to those places. I'm telling you, whoever you are, whatever your background is, 
You need truth in your life. You need to break away from every chain and every bond of every ideal, every philosophy, every blind guide that's ever been in your life. And you need to hear in your spirit, through your brain, allow God to open up truth to you. So that's going to be my prayer as I close this one. Please join us next week when I'll present a summary of class three, semester three. Now let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord our God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our eternal King, I pray for the hearer. I pray for the listener, O oh God, that it will permeate his soul, the words he hears, that he will consider this. That he will consider it as truth, ministering to truth within. And that, Lord, we will cast out all the negativity, all those things which would lie to us. That we would seek you, O Lord, in the one great source of our truth, by your power, O Lord. Open up and unlock within us, O Lord God, those hidden places. And I pray for miracles of healing. I pray, O Lord, for healings in life. And bring us, O Lord God, to our destined eternity in you, our source, our way. For you are the resurrection and you are the life. I pray for each one who is a part of this, O Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. This is Dr. Alan Charles, THD, bidding you farewell. Until we visit again, I invite you to examine all the postings that I have on my channel posted of class lectures and sermons and teachings. God bless you. Till next time.